start in the middle. You know, um, Grace, yes. I'll never see this. You're gonna, can you read this? Uh, You're gonna, I'll start, I'll introduce myself and you. And um, I don't know if they're all here. They're supposed to. Karen is on the. Do you remember? There's I think Karen you right there. Zoom that day. Yeah, Michael Bernard. Tony Kentary. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if the professor's here. Shall we? Yes, the professor, the honoree, oh, is right here. Uh, no, no, the professor. Oh. Okay. Nice to see you again, John. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What's that? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, oh yes. He can sit wherever he wants, right? Yeah, he can sit wherever <laughs> he wants. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's the okay? All right. Hey, Karen. Ready? We're ready. Good afternoon. And welcome to the second annual Judge Paul G. Feynman Awards Ceremony. I am Judge Jeanette Ogden. I am a member of the Richard C. Fowler Commission and also the Gender Fairness Committee for the 8th Judicial District and my co-judge and MC for today is the Honorable Grace Hanlon, also a member of the Fowler Commission. And we have some speakers, but before we get started, I'm just going to introduce some people that are here today. We have the Honorable Shirley Troutman from, oh, and the Honorable Judge Canizaro. Canizaro. Can, from the New York State Court of Appeals. <laughs> we have our PJ, the Honorable Gerald Whalen. And will all of the other judges please stand so we can acknowledge you. And will all of the members of the Richard C. Fowler Commission please stand so we can acknowledge you. And without further ado, Judge Hanlon is going to introduce our speakers. Good afternoon and welcome. Happy Pride. We have uh, a series of speakers here today. Uh, the first speaker is uh, appearing virtually from, uh, I believe, New York City. It's the Honorable Karen Lubloff. If, Lubloff? Sorry, Judge. Uh, she's the supervising judge of Family Court in New York County. She's also the co-chair of the FALA Commission, and she is our first speaker. Welcome, Judge. And uh, welcome. Hi, everybody. So it's Lupaloff, but with a name like Lupaloff, you pretty much say yes and respond to anything even close. So you did a beautiful job with the name. I'll take it. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, session, and uh, thank you for joining us for the second annual Paul Feynman Award Ceremony. So I just want to tell you the mission statement of our commission, which has been in effect for several years now. Uh, the Richard C. Fella LGBTQ Commission of the New York Courts is dedicated to promoting equal participation and access throughout the court system by all persons, regardless of your sexual orientation, your gender identity, or your gender expression. To fulfill our mission, the commission protects and enhances diversity and promotes the presence of the LGBTQ judicial and non-judicial personnel within the unified court system. We are an active, active commission. We are made up of judges, we are made up of attorneys, we are made up of law professors, uh, and it's uh, truly an honor for me to be part of this commission and to now be one of the co-chairs of the commission. Just a few moments to talk about some of the work we're actively doing now. Uh, we have recently started a mentoring program uh, which I think may be the first in the country of this sort. If, if I'm wrong, just pretend I'm right. Uh, and it's a program where we are mentoring uh, LGBTQ attorneys throughout New York State who are aspiring to become judges. 
So our mentors, our judges of all of our benches elected and appointed from really every court in our state. We've just started this program. We're beginning our first matching of about uh, 13 applicants and judges. Uh, and hopefully we will help guide these wonderful attorneys as they make their way through the elected or the uh, appointed process uh, to add to the rich diversity of our judiciary here in New York State. The commission also works with OCA leadership in developing uh, policies and practices. We work on education uh, to educate court staff on LGBTQ issues, including but not limited to the proper use of inclusive and appropriate language, not just for our court users, but for the attorneys and for staff as well. Uh, we also develop outreach as a commission, hoping to increase the number of LGBTQ staff members uh, here in the unified court system. So it's a very active commission. We meet several times a year. Uh, and again, I'm very uh, proud to be part of this. Now, the Paul Feynman Award. Uh, we started this award last year to honor Judge Feynman's uh, memory and really to honor his many accomplishments. Uh, many years ago, as uh, an ADA in the Manhattan DA's office, uh, Paul was in the same group of legal aid attorneys, so his team and my team worked with each other. Uh, I had so much respect uh, and liked him so much then, and that respect uh, and love continued uh, throughout and even now. So Judge Feynman was not only a spectacular judge and a spectacular leader of the LGBTQ community, he was uh, truly a spectacular human being. Kind, fair, always reaching for justice, and just a, a nice, nice man. So our commission decided to uh, start this award last year in his honor. And really, uh, it's indeed so fitting that our commission chose to honor uh, Mr. Gardner this year with this award. Mr. Gardner's work, and you'll hear much about it during this program, but his work resulted in the striking down of unfair and discriminatory laws that made it a crime just to love who you chose to love. Now, here we are in 2023 where there are leaders of our society today who want to go all the way backwards to again introduce hateful laws that again wish to criminalize people just because of who you choose to love. But what Bill Gardner's work has shown us, his trailblazing work has shown us is that our nation is a, a nation of laws and the rule of law will succeed the rule of law will remain fair. The rule of law will remain strong. We will not go backwards, and we will continue to do Mr. Gardner's work, ensuring that the LGBT community is treated with the same fairness and dignity and respect that all members of our society deserve. So congratulations to Mr. Gardner. Welcome to you all, and thank you for giving me this time. Thank you, Judge. Uh, our next speaker is the Honorable Deborah Kaplan, who is the Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for New York City Courts. Welcome, Judge, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I really wish I could be there with you in person. You know, Buffalo is actually one of my favorite places to sit in. Our to visit and I spent a lot of time there. But I really wanna thank everyone who's joining us either in person or virtually for this incredibly important program. Happy Pride and thank you to the Richard C. Fela LGBTQ Commission of the New York State Courts for putting this program together again and for honoring the memory of uh, my dear friend and friend to so many, Judge Paul Feynman. Um, I wanna recognize the co-chairs, Judge Karen Lupiloff. Of course, I've got 20 plus years of knowing how to say Lupiloff, so I've had a lot of practice with that. Supervising Judge, Family Court, New York County, and the Honorable Joanne Winslow, retired Associate Justice of the Appellate Division, Fourth Department, and of course, the uh, fabulous Executive Director, Matthew Skinner, for all of your hard work and all of the hard work of all of the uh, members. Um, I said last year when I was honored to speak at this event that we really don't need an award in Judge Feynman's name to remember Judge Feynman and who he is, because the painful fact of those of us who knew Paul Feynman we will never, ever forget him. Um, he was really my closest friend. 
Paul left a positive, enduring impact on so many lives, and I believe he remains a presence among us and is frankly impossible to forget. Nevertheless, I hope that all that is named in Judge Feynman's honor, including this important award bestowed today, signals to those who did not know him that he was the noblest of individuals. He was a person who was revered, cherished, and loved by so many. And he's been referred to as the beacon of light in the LGBTQ community and a fierce advocate for human rights. But I will tell you that the person who we choose to honor today with the Paul G. Feynman Award, William H. Gardner, is likewise a fierce advocate for human rights and so incredibly worthy of the award bestowed about him. And I am certain you will hear more about Mr. Gardner's Herculean efforts in the case of New York versus Uplinger all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and the disturbing uh, course that this particular case took through the New York State Courts before getting to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court and what we had believed may have been settled law, but apparently uh, until it got there was uh, not, even though our court said it was. And, you know, what? I think about the tortured course that this case took. We never lose sight when we look back at these cases and contemplate how it procedurally moves through various courts and the legal issues raised, is that the cases that come to our courts involve real people and real people whose lives are impacted and affected and sometimes upended. And Mr. Gardner never lost sight of that fact. And he chose to stand up and fight for the rights of individuals whose private conduct was being criminalized. And he has been called a gay rights champion and a champion of justice, I believe Mr. Gardner is. So, Mr. Gardner, I salute you. You are to be recognized and commended for all that you have accomplished. You are, as I said, a champion of justice. And, sir, you are most deserving of an award named after Judge Paul Feynman, who was always a fierce advocate for human rights and whose entire career was focused on promoting equal justice and justice for all. So thank you to the Fela Commission for giving me a few minutes to talk to you about Judge Feynman, and the privilege to speak today and congratulate Mr. Gardner. I'm so very honored to be part of this program, this important event, and to remember our dearest friend, Judge Paul Feynman. Thank you, Judge Kaplan. Our next speaker is also appearing virtually. It's Judge Joseph A. Zayas, he is the newly appointed Chief Administrative Judge for the New York uh, Court, Unified Court System. Congratulations on your new appointment, Judge, and whenever you're ready. Great. Th thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, as uh, Judge Kaplan said, uh, uh, I wish I could be in Buffalo. Uh, we actually were interviewing for the new DCAJ uh, for upstate uh, this morning. So we couldn't do both things at, at the same time, but it's good to see you all there. Happy to see uh, Judge Canataro there. I think I've seen him uh, like what, three days in a row. Uh, and he was walking around with luggage yesterday at the event. And now I know why he was walking around with luggage because he was probably going to Buffalo. Um, but uh, thank you, Mr. Skinner and the commission for inviting me to say a few words. Happy Pride Day. Uh, Pride Month, um, and it's so exciting to see uh, uh, this, uh, to be uh, asked to speak at the second annual Judge Feynman Awards Ceremony. Um, so as you heard, I, I, I'm on this new job. My new role is uh, two weeks old. If you look behind me, I, I haven't even had time to put up pictures of my family or my, my, uh, my degrees, uh, but it's been exciting. Uh, thank you for all of the uh, congratulatory remarks that I've received, uh, remarks that I've received, and emails and texts, etc. Uh, and I am honored to have been appointed as the chief administrative judge, and uh, even more excited about the prospect of working uh, with our new chief judge, uh, chief Chief Judge uh, Rowan uh, Wilson. So uh, it's very gratifying to, uh, as the CAJ, to know that there are events like this planned uh, throughout the state. Uh, I have, I'm already scheduled to attend a few of them. Um, and um, I'm, I was at the, um, uh, the New, York, New York County Courthouse where uh, Judge, Judge Fe the, uh, the, the, um, 
uh, portrait of Judge Feynman was, uh, was uh, disclosed and, and revealed, and it was very exciting. He's, he's a good friend of mine, and um, I'm, I'm excited that there's an award named after him. I happen to have a photo that I'm gonna share with you. I hope you can see this. Um, and it is, um, I don't know, some of you know, Judge Feynman was a, a big Mets fan, and we had the habit of uh, going to see uh, the Mets at City Field, uh, not, not Yankee Stadium. I don't know if you can see this, but this is uh, our friend Judge Feynman and Judge Acosta and uh, myself. And we would do this uh, annually, and it was uh, just a wonderful time. You see him there with his Mets hat, uh, really loved him. And um, uh, I thought that seeing that photo would warm your hearts. It's a photo that I keep in my, my chambers. And um, I do want to say congratulations to uh, Mr. Gardner uh, on receiving this award tonight for, for fighting the good fight um, and for getting into, uh, quote, good trouble, uh, as uh, the late Congressman John Lewis uh, used to say. Used to, uh, say. Uh, I, there's a lot to be said. I, I wanted to share a, a personal story that um, uh, happened to me in, in growing up because I think there are a lot of heroes uh, like Mr. Gardner, maybe not to that extent in terms of bringing, uh, bringing cases to the New York Court of Appeals and to the Supreme Court that have been fighting this battle. And um, so I, I grew up uh, with four brothers, a single mom raising four sons. Can you imagine five, having five sons and uh, five sons and raise it, raising uh, uh, as a single mom? And uh, one of my brothers uh, was gay. And um, at some point in in um, uh, their, his his relationship with his partner, his partner's family uh, kicked him out of out of the home once they found out that he was gay. And um, I remember as a I mean, I must have been 13 or 14, 10, 10 uh, you know, just a teenager. And um, my brother's partner came to our house uh, with two black eyes and a busted lip and, and, and was bleeding. And um, I, I, think of, I think of my mother because she taught me the, um, the, the principle of unconditional love. And, and we're talking about the 70s. And in the 70s, my uh, mother... Uh, took in, I mean, think about those days. I mean, some of you are young in that audience, but it was really a different time. And uh, my, uh, my mother uh, and my, my, uh, my four brothers, my other uh, three brothers, welcomed my brother's partner into our home. And we basically took him in and he lived with us um, uh, for a long time, uh, for a good period of time. And uh, that's the that's the message that I am so grateful that uh, I I was blessed to know uh, in this 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 area. So um, I'm excited to be a part of this. Uh, those those memories of the unconditional love that my mother showed to all people. Um, even even if I would say even if I would use the word. I mean, this is getting a little silly, but there was a one time I I I grew up in Manhattan and. Um, Every taxi driver that drove by, I would, I don't know why I did this, but I would say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I remember, I remember my mother over something as silly as this, don't you ever use that word hate, not even for taxi drivers. And um, so I feel so blessed that she, um, she taught me those things. But uh, thanks again for having me say a few words and uh, I appreciate it. And um, I hope the, uh, the rest of the program goes great. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. We have uh, with us today the presiding justice of the appellate division of the fourth department, uh, the Honorable Gerald Whalen, who will say a few words also. I'll be very brief. You have a, a lot of speakers uh, on. I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, touch upon my relationship with uh, Paul Feynman. Um, as, an it, it, as being a part of the administrative board, which are of the courts of the state of New York, all the presiding justice and the chief judge of the Court of Appeals. Uh, we engage regularly with the Court of Appeals um, uh, members and, uh, and it's always a delight to get together in Albany uh, with them. Uh, and I had that opportunity uh, with Judge Feynman. 
So I was able to, to spend some time with him both socially and actually I was vouched in on a case that we sat together on, on the Court of Appeals. And uh, he was truly a remarkable judge, a remarkable person. Um, and uh, the, the, type, the kind of person that, you know, when you first meet somebody, you know you're meeting the genuine person. He was somebody that you could engage in a conversation. There were no masks, there were no um, uh, trying to get through to who he really was. He was just so, such a good hearted soul and also having engaged with him on the Court of Appeals with the case, a brilliant jurist. And so it's wonderful that the Fail Commission has deemed it uh, appropriate to have this award in his name. Um, I would also just like to say as I conclude, um, I can't imagine a better um, person to grant the award to. Um, Bill Gardner is an icon of the legal community uh, locally. Uh, it's a name that when I was first in law school, I heard for the first time um, as someone who took on tough cases, challenging cases, um, and was just a gifted lawyer um, and, and, uh, and brought that to bear in these hard cases. And so congratulations on, on the Paul Feynman Award and thank you for allowing me to speak briefly to you today. Thank you, Judge Whalen. Next, we have the executive director of the Fela Commission, uh, Matthew Skinner, who was really instrumental in putting this whole program together. So thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much. You know, I want to just start by saying a, a thank you myself to a gentleman who's coming up uh, later in the program, but um, Bob Conklin, uh, who accepted a phone call from a stranger, I think three or four months ago, and really made <laughs> a lot of this possible today. Um, so a big thank you to Bob, and I, I, it's great to meet you in person after many, many phone conversations uh, over the past few months. And thank you to everybody who's here. This started as, um, you know, as I mentioned, as, a, a, as an idea that maybe seemed far-fetched or impossible when we started thinking about this year's award. And I'm, it's just uh, really almost overwhelming for me to see you all uh, here today and for this to be actually happening, because we've really um, thought long and hard about uh, putting this together. So thank you to everybody. Um, I was trying to think what I was going to say that wouldn't overlap with some of the people that are coming after me, but I, I guess I'm just going to share um, an anecdote about something that happened uh, two nights ago, and I, I got to Western New York to Rochester uh, Wednesday for just a bar association dinner with Judge Winslow, who's coming up, and I knew she was getting an award, so I, we, we did something in Rochester yesterday as well, so I was like, I'll come to Rochester on Wednesday, we'll make a week of this Western New York uh, uh, trip, and um, so in any event, it was just a bar association uh, dinner in Rochester that I um, hadn't given a lot of thought to, but as the award ceremony proceeded, um, you know, I started to notice something. And it was, uh, I joked to Judge Winslow after the ceremony, I said, was there a single heterosexual person involved with this program tonight? Um, and it was sort of a joke, but also serious. I, you know, there was one honoree that I had known uh, for a long time, just in a professional capacity. And I saw her kiss her wife after her wife got an award. And I was like, no kidding, you know? <laughs> um, and I was thinking in the, in the days since then and thinking about this award, you know, this reality that we all live in today and there's going to be, uh, you know, there's already been some things said about all the awful things that have happened this year and there's been plenty of them. Uh, and we're covering that as the Fela Commission in lots of programs this month. Um, but this reality that we live in 2023 where you know, LGBT people are woven into the fabric of civic life and it, you can go to a bar association dinner and, uh, you know, four out of the six honorees are lesbians and uh, one of the awards is named after a famous uh, transgender woman. Um, and it's just like a thing that's, that's happening without much, much thought or consideration. But I think about the world um, that Mr. Gardner was confronting in the early 80s and, um, that world probably seemed <laughs> like completely impossible, um, but it seemed like something worth fighting for, and I, I, I hope I'm not putting words into his mouth, something worth fighting for. Um, 
and I want to just, I guess, thank him on a personal level, uh, you know, for, for, for burning the whole art, you know, the whole edifice of, uh, uh, for, for looking at a world where a, a whole group of people was condemned to sort of isolation and fear, to looking at that reality and just burning it to the ground. Um, you know, this past year, there were two members of our community that were uh, in contention to be chief judge. I mean, uh, that almost went without, without notice, but it's like this, uh, we have to, I think, put our, put our brains into the reality of the early 1980s. Uh, when we weren't being looked at to potentially be chief judge, we were being arrested on the streets of Buffalo. Um, and I imagine it was incredibly difficult to go to uh, your law firm at the time and say, you know, I'd, I'd really like to take on this project and uh, it's not going to bring in any money to the firm and it might take several years and it might go to the Supreme Court and uh, it's uh, going to, you know, involve taking on the whole power structure in Buffalo. Um, is that okay with everybody? I mean, uh, I, I can't imagine what that meeting must have been like, but I want to thank you for, for looking in the mirror one morning and saying, you know, I'm going to go for this, and I hope, uh, I hope it works out. I mean, yesterday was a Supreme Court decision day, and I, my partner uh, who's here is, was, is eagerly awaiting one of the decisions this year, and I was thinking about how much, um, how much coverage there is on a, a day when the decisions come out, and how you can immediately read the decisions, and they immediately have analysis of if this person wrote this decision, then we know this person uh, has to write the, the decision he's waiting for. And I was thinking, you know, I was looking at these old newsletters. Uh, I included a picture of one of them on the back of the program. Um, they were, you know, in this newsletter, they were saying, if you want a copy of this decision, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to this person and you can, you know, we'll, we'll mail you a copy of this decision. I don't think we can even wrap our minds around how challenging <laughs> basic tasks were in 1980, you know, let alone predicting what the judges on the Court of, the P Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court were going to do um, with the cases you were bringing to them. Um, so my mind, again, just... Uh, can't wrap its head around um, what you uh, what you did for all of us, the world that you've helped create, and I just uh, I, I deeply, deeply thank you for for doing that work. Thank you, Matt. Next, we have a professor of law from the UB Law School uh, who was instrumental in your. Uh, pamphlets, you'll see a historical marker that's across from the Lenox Hotel on North Street near Delaware uh, about what Mr. Gardner did and about the Umplinger case. Uh, and our next speaker was instrumental, along with his students, in having that historical marker put up. And I can't thank him enough for that. Uh, Professor Michael Bucati. Well, first, I'm sorry to say that I was not responsible uh, for that marker. That was the uh, Buffalo Niagara um, LGBTQ history uh, project, so uh, of which I was a member and, and whose board on uh, I once sat on. But <clears throat> but that was not my work, and I can't take credit for it. All right. So so with that said, uh, good uh, a good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate those who've been brief uh, because I plan, uh, in true law professor form, to take all 15 minutes I was offered. Um, because it really is an honor to participate in this richly deserved celebration of Bill Gardner and the 20th anniversary of Lawrence versus Texas. Unlike the many of you who have known Bill uh, for decades, I first uh, met him in 2016 when he was honored by UB Law School's LGBTQ uh, affinity group. But as a student of queer history and queer legal history in particular, I had known of Bill for much longer than that. I knew him because of two cases, People versus Onofre, where in 1980, the New York Court of Appeals struck down the state's sodomy prohibition, and People versus Uplinger, already mentioned, where in 1983, that same court struck down the state's prohibition of loitering or soliciting with the purpose to engage in, quote, deviant sexual intercourse. 
Now, when, when Matt kindly extended uh, an invitation to speak at this event, I asked him what he might like me to address, and he gave two answers that pulled in rather different directions. Uh, I could, on one hand, I could reflect on Lawrence in light of the Supreme Court's decision last summer to overrule Roe v. Wade, or I could refresh our collective memory of those two momentous rulings I just mentioned. With respect to Dobbs' effect on Lawrence, um, it's a depressing subject, uh, even, even taking into account my cautiously optimistic view of the near future, and I would stress the word near. On the other hand, talking about Onofre, and especially Uplinger, is something that will bring me, and maybe you, some joy. So that's what I'll do. Uh, so let's start by going back to the late 1950s, when Bill was a uh, student in the law school where I now teach. <clears throat> Those years aren't generally remembered as a high point uh, for lesbian and gay rights in the United States. But throughout the 1950s, the American Law Institute, or ALI, had been making public a series of drafts of its model penal code, or MPC, uh, an effort to systematize and rationalize American criminal law. At that point, every state in the Union had a law against sodomy, an offense that, depending on the jurisdiction, covered a variety of sexual couplings other than penovaginal intercourse. In 1955, the ALI uh, voted to remove uh, from that year's draft any prohibition of private consensual sexual conduct, regardless of the participants' genders, and the MPC adhered to that controversial decision up to the final version that was adopted in 1962. But both the 1955 and 1962 versions of the MPC also included a provision on, quote, homosexual imposition and public solicitation, which made it a misdemeanor to solicit what it called deviate sexual intercourse. Sound familiar? Uh, and to solicit it from an individual with one whom had no prior uh, acquaintance. Now, the MPC had a profound impact on this state's penal law, but when it came to gay sex and gay solicitation, our legislature settled on the worst of both worlds retaining its longstanding prohibition of uh, the former, of sodomy, while incorporating in modified form the MPC's prohibition of the latter, solicitation to uh, sodomy or deviant intercourse. And that's where New York law would stand for the next 20 years or so. And a lot happened in those two decades. The growth of the homophile movement that, that had uh, begun in the 1950s, the concomitant development of queer social life and political consciousness, the emergence of gay liberation in the late 1960s, including, of course, the Stonewall Riots of 1969, and with breathtaking speed, a nationwide proliferation of gay organizations, gay media, gay bars, gay neighborhoods, and a new gay species of person, the out homosexual. For both the homophile movement and the gay liberation movement that followed it, repeal of sodomy laws was a top priority. True, those laws were rarely enforced directly. Both the private and the consensual nature of the forbidden conduct made uh, direct enforcement difficult. But sodomy prohibitions expressed a strong cultural condemnation of homosexuality, and they furnished a legal basis for a host of other anti-gay enforcements, from disorderly conduct prosecutions to dishonorable discharges from the military to denials of queer parents' custody and visitation rights. Given those profound and not so infrequent collateral effects, in states whose legislatures didn't act to legalize homosexual intimacy, gay people and their advocates looked to the judiciary. And we're here today because Bill Gardner played a trailblazing role in the development of this latter court-focused path to decriminalization. So to begin with Onofre, sometime in 1977, a 17-year-old male named uh, Richard Onofre uh, Ronald Onofre, excuse me, had committed, uh, uh, reported to the police that, he, that someone had committed upon him, uh, I'm sorry, the 17 year old male reported that Ro uh, Ronald Onofre had committed upon him uh, the, fe uh, uh, the felony of forcible sodomy. Uh, and Onofre insisted that the sex was consensual. And to prove it, he showed Syracuse District Attorney Richard Hennessy photos of himself and the young man engaged in sexual conduct. And it didn't look non consensual at all. And those racy pictures, uh, did the trick, but only up to a point. 
Rather than pursuing an accusation of forcible sodomy, Hennessy opted to charge Onofre under the state's consensual uh, uh, sodomy statute. Bonnie Strunk, Onofre's attorney, moved to dismiss the charge on the ground that, among other things, it violated her, uh, her client's constitutional right to privacy. And at the same time that appeal was pending, Bill Gardner was defending, I assume pro bono, at least two sodomy prosecutions in the Buffalo City Courts. Both cases of Bill's involved clients whom police found having oral sex in parked cars. In one, a female sex worker, in the other two, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the other two men. So when Bill learned of Onofre's appeal, he decided on behalf of his clients and for the sake of his cause to file an amicus brief uh, for the National Committee for Sexual Liberties, an organization of which he was an active member. Now, I have yet to locate a copy of that brief, and if you have it, Bill, I would, I, in, your, in your file somewhere, I'd love, I'd love to see it. But, but it wouldn't surprise me uh, to find uh, some real influence on the Fourth Judicial Department's unanimous decision uh, of January 1980, which held, quote, that personal sexual conduct is a fundamental right broad enough to include consensual homosexual activity. Now it was D.A. Hennessy's uh, turn to appeal, and Onofre traveled along with uh, Bill's Buffalo cases to the state's highest court, where it attracted nationwide attention, with amicus briefs flowing in from the New York City Bar Association, the NYCLU, and Lambda Legal Defense Fund. The Court of Appeals it, uh, issued its decision uh, that December, holding the state's sodomy statute unconstitutional under the federal constitution. The decision said nothing, uh, absolutely nothing, about the New York Constitution, despite, it must be said, uh, a wise effort by Bill Gardner and his collaborators at Lambda, on whose board he sat, to steer the court toward reliance on both constitutions. Now, Onofre wasn't the first American decision to strike laws um, uh, banning private consensual sexual activity, but it was the first to do so in a case directly involving uh, plaintiff, I'm sorry, uh, defendants who were, uh, uh, who were convicted of homosexual conduct. And as such, uh, it was a particularly sweet gay rights victory. But, but the demise of New York's consensual sodomy prohibition didn't end state interference in gay people's sex lives. Under the enthusiastic let's say, leadership of uh, Captain Kenneth Kennedy, Buffalo's Vice Squad continued its longstanding practice of prosecuting gay men under the state's prohibition of loitering or soliciting for, again, deviate sexual uh, um, conduct. And here, finally, we come to Uplinger. This story begins after midnight on April 7th, 1981, when a handsome teacher named Bob Uplinger is arrested for inviting an undercover officer uh, that he meets on North Street uh, across from the Lennox Hotel to his apartment for oral sex. So what does uh, uh, Bob do the next morning? He calls Bill, who immediately takes the case and files a motion to dismiss. Citing Onofre, Bill argues that Uplinger can't be prosecuted for soliciting conduct that's legal, much less constitutionally protected. And indeed, it's a black letter principle of modern criminal law, that a solicitation necessarily refers to a target crime. It's a request, suggestion, or encouragement to commit some other offense. Hence the anomalousness of the MPC's recommendation to legalize gay sex while criminalizing invitations to have gay sex. Now, something I didn't mention earlier uh, in describing the advent of that MPC recommendation are the reasons behind it. In the MPC's form, it's a complicated story, but in the MPC's uh, formal commentary, the code's drafters deny any intention to regulate private intimacy. Instead, quote, the rationale for this offense, the solicitation offense, is the suppression of public nuisance. Persons who publicly seek or make themselves available for deviant sexual relations annoy and harass members of the public who do not wish to be involved. Buffalo City Judge Timothy Drury agreed, crediting, quote, the real possibility that a man may be solicited, harassed, or confronted at the very door to his house. Judge Drury ruled in November 1981 that, quote, a sufficient connection exists between the activity at issue in that case and the public's uh, loss of the use and enjoyment of its streets. Bill then took Uplinger's case to the county court where it was consolidated with two others, both involving women alleged to be sex uh, workers. And it was at this point that Bill himself took on one of those 
additional cases, People versus Sanders. Then came another loss, and yet another appeal to the state's highest court, where Uplinger, his fellow appellants, and their amici argued that the loitering statute was unconstitutional on an almost dizzying array of grounds. Vagueness, freedom of speech, freedom of association, overbreadth, equal protection, and the right to privacy. On February 23rd, 1983, the New York Court of Appeals voted six to one to strike the law. But its opinion didn't make clear which constitutional principles the law offended. In a brief procurium opinion, the court held that the loitering statute, quote, must be viewed as a companion statute to the consensual sodomy statute. Inasmuch as consensual sodomy may not be deemed criminal under Onofre, we perceive no basis on which the state may continue to punish loitering for that purpose, exactly the first argument Bill had made at the beginning of the case. Now, District uh, Attorney Richard Arcara, the name is no doubt familiar to you, uh, now sought review from the US Supreme Court. His cert petition was granted, good for him, uh, but, but very soon he was blindsided by an amicus brief filed by the state's chief legal officer, New York's uh, Attorney General Bob Abrams, endorsing Bill Gardner's claims of unconstitutionality. In other words, the people in People versus Uplinger were contradicting themselves. And that was one of three issues uh, which consumed the bulk of oral argument in the Supreme Court in January 1974. The second issue, the ambiguity of the, of the decision on appeal, was, if anything, even more unflattering to the Excelsior State. And it was a subject that Bill shrewdly chose to address at the first opportunity, beginning with this colloquy with Justice Byron White. Mr. Gardner. Justice, and may it please the court. I agree with my opponent that this was a constitutional adjudication below. I don't believe that needs to be proved, but if there is any need for proof of it, uh, one need only look at the record. The only issue that was raised in the lower courts and presented to the Court of Appeals was a constitutional challenge uh, on the, based on the United States Constitution. Uh, it was the challenge was based on both the United States Constitution and the state constitution. And what was the case adjudicated on? One can't uh, uh, determine that by looking at the Uplinger decision by itself. No, but the How about an uh, The Onofre decision was adjudicated solely under the United States Constitution. Right, and they re and here they relied on an uh, Yes, uh, that's what they said in their decision. And I have no doubt, therefore, that they made this adjudication under the federal constitution as well. Um, I think that some of the problems we have procedurally at this point is that both counsel for both parties have some difficulty, as I'm sure the court does, in the brief opinion that was written by the Court of Appeals in knowing exactly what they were saying. Uh. One gets a sense maybe why you were uh, such a treasured member of the gay men's chorus. What a, what a voice. Um, so, so Justice White remained Bill's main jousting partner for the majority of, uh, or for the remainder of, the, of that oral argument. Um, uh, giving, giving expression to a sentiment evidently shared by several of his colleagues, White repeatedly evoked a situation in which, God forbid, a homosexual overture is made to a heterosexual man. And this was the day's third major theme. So anyone must put up with uh, being solicited on the street? No, Your Honor. In Commonwealth versus Safranca, I, I commend you to that case. And in the prior decision, what the court said was that uh, you could not be convicted unless there was some reason to believe or some indication that there was someone present who would be offended thereby. Well, the, the, the solicitee, the person who solicited is the one who's most offended. But let me pose you uh, these facts, if I may. Suppose I meet an individual and we have a discussion for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever, and it quickly becomes apparent that we are both homosexuals and that uh, he is interested and well, therefore I extend an invitation. That How may be, be that may be, that may be uh, fine, but I'm talking about the person, talking about the person who, uh, who uh, 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 turns him down now? Can the, and he's very annoyed by it. Can the can the can the man then be convicted for uh, for uh, uh, 
annoying this other person? He can if there was an element of harassment or if there was an well, element, element of harassment. <laughs> he says, I am harassed. I don't like to be, be walking down the street and be accosted a, a, by a homosexual. Uh, <clears throat> the word accosted and, and the word well, solicited by a homosexual. So uh, there's a lot to applaud in Bill's performance in just that small clip. Um, what pluck, really? Uh, uh, but, but the one I want to underscore uh, today is Bill's effort there, and indeed uh, throughout the entire Uplinger litigation, to give these judges a sense of how gay life uh, is actually lived. And, and I find that effort most, uh, captured most poignantly in a subsequent exchange he had with Chief Justice Berger, where Bill explains that the accosted uh, heterosexual scenarios of Justice White's imagination almost always involved situations just like Uplinger's, situations that, that is where our defenseless, guileless, guiltless heterosexual is an undercover cop. Which brings me finally to the main point I want to make about Bill Gardner's years-long project. His, his crusade, as he called it in one interview, to obliterate New York's anti-gay loitering and solicitation law. Long before he learned it through personal experience, uh, Bill has been admirably candid, uh, admirably candid about his own arrest under the statute. He understood that the solicitation law was important in ways even more pernicious uh, than the sodomy ban invalidated in Onofre. As Professor Bill Eskridge has written, everywhere in the United States, many more men were arrested each year for solicitation, lewd vagrancy, or disorderly conduct than for violation of sodomy laws. And as Professor Patricia Kane has observed, most solicitation cases arose because police decoys entered gay bars or other gay gathering places and seduced individuals into suggesting a sexual liaison. I think we tend to associate that kind of practice with gay life pre-Stonewall. But Uplinger and quite a few of Bill's other pro, uh, pro bono cases show that such practices persisted and in some times and places intensified as gay individuals and communities became more visible after Stonewall. Uplinger, in other words, was about vindicating queer social life, creating space, literal and figurative, for queer people to find each other, be with one another, and if they chose, go to bed with one another which is to say that Bill's vindication of gay social life necessarily redounded in turn to the benefit of gay private life because so much sex, because so many relationships resulted from connections forged in public places. So it was no diminishment of Bill's accomplishment when in 1983, the New York native dubbed him the man who made it legal to cruise. The Supreme Court now issued its uh, anticlimactic ruling in Uplinger on May 30th, 1984. Uh, expressing uncertainty, quote, as to the precise federal question uh, presented and, and noting the fundamental conflict between the district attorney's position and the attorney general's position, uh, the justices decided not to decide. Less than two years later, however, in March 1986, a five-justice majority announced in Bowers versus Hardwick that contrary to Onofre's reading of our nation's basic charter, the claim of, quote, a constitutional right to engage in homosexual sodomy is, at best, facetious. A long 17 years later, in June 2003, the court took back that vituperative statement, affirming in Lawrence versus Texas what Bill Gardner had been saying all along. What a joy it is to celebrate that victory with you today, and how fitting that we simultaneously honor Bill Gardner, a pioneer in the movement that led to Lawrence. Our next speaker is Mr. Robert Conklin, a retired partner with Hudson Ross. Mr. Conklin. First, Matthew, thank you for inviting me to represent Hudson Russ as a lifelong place for Bill to ply his ingenuity. Hudson Russ is a very old firm in Buffalo. They traced their roots back to 1800s. And when Bill started there, it was called 
Hudson, Russ, Andrews, Woods, and Goodyear. A more conservative group of five people you've never met before. <laughs> and yet there was a place at that place for Republicans, Democrats, and even Bill Gardner. But he didn't start there. He started at the UB Law School, as you've heard. He also worked for a federal judge for a little while, a very, very conservative Republican federal judge who he served well. And then when he got out into the practice, uh, Bill uh, decided, and he went to Hudson Russ, by the way, obviously, he decided that he was going to take on some cases as well as do the work that was expected of him in the billable hour world of large firms. And so where did I meet Bill the first time? Uh, it's about 55 years ago. I'm a law clerk for another federal judge, Judge Curtin, and there were a bunch of selective service cases where people were being indicted for not taking the step. And it was a matter of great consequence in Western New York because there were a lot of these cases. Well, we had a number of them assigned to Judge Curtin. And one day, there was a case. I don't remember the name. I don't remember the outcome. But I do remember this. The lawyer for the defendant was William H. Gardner. What an experience for a law clerk to see this kind of a lawyer at that stage in my life. The papers were this thick. By the way, he types his own papers. <laughs> they were really well done. But I sort of expected that because he came from a really good firm. And the argument was unforgettable because he passionately represented that person. And you could tell that this was an important part of his view of his role as a lawyer. Well, that's how I met Willie. Willie became my close friend at Hudson Russ. He's one of the reasons why I probably decided to go there myself. It's one of the reasons why Bill spent his entire legal career at the, at the law firm. And it's one of the reasons why I did as well. Um, Bill is 90 years old as we sit here today. And he's the oldest living retired partner of our firm. Dubious distinction, but nevertheless, he tells me when we go to lunch, Robert, I expect to live to 100. And I say, good for you. And I think he's on the way. His birthday and my birthday are one day apart. And he reminds me every year. Anyway, as our firm got bigger, the name, Hodson Russ, Andrews, Woods, and Goodyear, uh, got smaller to Hodson Russ LLP. But the bigger didn't change us much because we are still a large firm and we have lots of corporate clients, and we have lots of different points of view, and we still like to make a living. And so being a lawyer at Hodson Russ and cohabiting with a bunch of other lawyers that worry about making a living and, and, and satisfying clients, when your uh, secondary goal is to preserve the rule of law, not only for gay people, but people uh, that are uh, unjustifiably uh, find themselves in trouble in our courts is quite a challenge. Um, and so, as I thought about uh, what Matthew asked me to do a week ago, uh, he said, spend five minutes on Bill Gardner, but not about the Uplinger line of cases. Uh, spending five minutes on Bill Gardner is the greatest injustice one could ever do. The stories at Hudson Russ about Bill Gardner and in the Western New York community uh, go on and on and on. We could have a couple of kegs of beer and we could start telling Willie stories and we'd have a wonderful time because there's just no ending to them all. Bill is a litigator. He's represented banks. He's represented people in bankruptcy cases. He's representing criminal defendants, not just the folks uh, and difficulty with the state's sodomy laws, but people with, in all walks of life because uh, he believes in representing people who are in need of representation, usually on a pro bono basis, and that's very important to him. Bill is one of these folks that not only 
represents people zealously, but he does it fully. He takes his talent, which is substantial, his treasures, I used to kid him, Bill, you don't have to, you don't have to pay for the uh, stuff that you're doing for these people. He was subsidizing clients' disbursements because he didn't want to ask his partners to pay for it. Well, he'd give money to charity. I'd say, Bill, you don't have to give that much money to charity. An enormously generous person, to this day, in fact. Uh, and, and then time. Bill would work all the time. Uh, there's a story going around that I can't prove personally, but somebody once found him working on a billable matter, uh, but he had spent so much time at the office that he was sleeping between the rows of books in the library. Somebody encountered them that early morning, and they thought he was dead. <laughs> Happily, uh, he's going to live to 100. So, I mean, we're talking about a lawyer that uh, you folks have identified for your award. Uh, I'm talking about a lawyer and a person who qualifies unmistakably to get the, the award that you have uh, decided to give in Judge Feynman's name because you've talked about Judge Feynman not only as a person interested in this cause, but a good person, to the core, a good person. And Willie is a good person. So Bill, uh, I got to tell you, uh, it would be remiss of me of not to tell the world that you have mentored. Sometimes uh, they didn't always like it. A lot of young lawyers, you've groomed them. I can imagine what Rick Getz would say if he was here. Um, and if we were able to get all these young people that you've helped bring along at the firm over the years, uh, we could tell Willie's stories forever and ever. And they'd all have many. And I have several that I can't tell here today. <laughs> anyway, uh, Bill is not only a, a superb lawyer, and it's Hudson Russ's great uh, advantage to have had him all those years, but at the end of his career, he became an expert in risk management and ethics, such that in his final chapter at Hudson Russ, he became our first general counsel. And that's not without significance because we used to kid and call him the conscience of the firm, and that doesn't come easy. And so uh, all of those things together, as I was sitting here listening to your description, some of you folks that knew Judge Feynman, I said, I didn't know it when Matthew asked me to do this, but Judge Feynman and Bill Gardner have an awful lot in common. And so I got to tell you that he's received a lot of awards. And uh, he probably could, if, a, if he lives to 100, he'll probably get a few more. But this is a fine award for him, given his contribution to our system. And I am very, very proud to be his friend. Thank you, Mr. Conklin. Uh, next, I'd like to... Uh, bring up to the podium the Honorable Anthony Canatero from the New York State Court of Appeals. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was at an event a couple weeks ago with our newly installed chief judge of the state of New York, uh, Rowan Wilson. and. He was asked to speak at the event, and I don't think he had any knowledge that he was going to be asked to speak at the event. And he, he articulated a rule, a good rule, that uh, he, when you're invited to an event, even uh, whether you're asked to speak or not, it's always wise to prepare a few remarks, uh, especially when you're someone in that position. Um, I am no longer the acting chief judge of New York, and I thought I had cleared that hurdle. Uh, that hurdle. So when I, was, uh, when I was invited to come speak here today, I really thought I was being invited just to come and show my support. Uh, I didn't know that I was being asked to speak as well. And I know that there were some conversations with Matt because I just heard about content and time limits and it's sort of like a Rashomon kind of experience where everyone talks about their conversation with Matt about how much time they have to speak. But I'm positive we did not discuss me speaking at this event. <laughs> So I will be uh, mercifully short 
uh, and I'm sure I'm not going to get any objection from, from you on that account because we have an important award presentation to get to. I'd just like to say a few words about Judge Paul Feynman and, uh, and a few words about today's honoree, uh, Mr. Gardner. Um, we, we heard it said uh, a little earlier that Paul, Fe Paul, Paul Feynman touched s just about everyone who he came into contact with uh, indelibly. He was a man of incredible compassion, such a huge generosity of spirit. I had forgotten until the chief administrative judge spoke earlier uh, what a huge Mets fan he was, but he, he managed to forge personal connections with everyone he met. And while it has been suggested that we don't need an award to remember Paul, and that's something I agree with because everyone who met Paul uh, will find it, I think, impossible to forget him uh, for the rest of their lives. There are so many of us out there who, who didn't know Paul, and I think it was absolutely wonderful that we instituted this award in Paul's name to honor those attributes that made him so special. Now, I don't know Mr. Gardner well enough to talk about his generosity of spirit or um, his, um, his ability to connect with people, but what I do know th that he shares in common with Judge Feynman is Judge Feynman was such, uh, such a groundbreaker in so many ways and such a breaker of barriers uh, throughout his entire life and his career, culminating ultimately in his appointment as the first openly LGBT uh, member of the New York State Court of Appeals. Uh, and he leaves behind a huge legacy. As a matter of fact, I was the uh, judge who succeeded Judge Feynman to the bench at the Court of Appeals. And by, uh, by process of um, the way things work up there, uh, I was put into his chambers where some of his personal effects were left. And um, I, I have spent afternoons uh, going through Paul's books where he left notes in the margins of, of various uh, things that he was reading and uh, had some of his, uh, some of his uh, notes and, and other, other correspondence that was left behind, which I all returned to his husband. But, uh, you know, I, I am never too far away from Judge Feynman. And I can tell you, he was an incredible person who really knew, uh, who really took on challenges with such grace and dignity. And I was listening to, uh, and by the way, I attended a program. Uh, I, it could have been uh, a year ago, but I think it was more like two years ago, where Professor Bukai talked about many of the things that he just talked about today, about the story of the litigation uh, that, that you all just heard. And I was struck then, as I was uh, today, and I think Matt alluded to this, that when, when these cases were being litigated, this was not a popular cause. This was not a cause celeb. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of resistance in the legal community, in the community at large, uh, to, to these very fundamental rights uh, that we almost take for granted today. And it struck me, even listening to the oral arguments that were just played back, and, we had, and I had heard them previously, that these discussions seemed to be centered around uh, interactions involving people who are entirely alien to the judges who were listening to, to, to that case. It sounded almost as if they were talking about a different species of humanity. And it is remarkable uh, when you think about how far we have come as a community uh, since really just uh, a few decades ago. And I am grateful, uh, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of our entire community, uh, to Mr. Gardner for his efforts in bringing about that change, in acting as an accelerant for that change, and for treating people with just common dignity and decency and taking up a cause you believe in uh, because it's just the right thing to do. So uh, I'm just going to add my word of thanks on that account, and we will now, I think, get on to the, to the real highlight of today's uh, uh, gathering, which is the presentation of the Paul Feynman Award to Mr. Gardner. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Judge. Uh, I'd like to bring up uh, Judge Joanne Winslow. She is a retired Associate Justice of the Appellate Division, Fourth Department, and also the co-chair of the Fela Commission for the presentation of the Feynman Award to Mr. Gardner. It's just going to be another couple minutes. I get to say a few things, too. Um, Having just retired, uh, I reflected on what being a trailblazer is because having gotten, uh, having received an award uh, two nights ago, as Matt had mentioned, you know, you start to reflect on your career and what it meant and what it might mean to others. And Judge Paul Feynman was a trailblazer. We all know that. We all uh, love him dearly. And he certainly was the first openly gay judge on, on our Court of Appeals. And we are so grateful uh, for having had him amongst us. Today, we're going to celebrate someone else who's a trailblazer. You know, the context of this, uh, the professor mentioned 1969, the Stonewall riots in New York City. Uh, People versus Onofre in 1980, Syracuse case. In between, in 1973, the American Bar Association uh, made a recommendation basically saying that um, the sodomy laws should be deemed unconstitutional. So from 73 to 80, between that and Onofre, then in 81 you had the case that went here into Buffalo City Court where a hearing was held. And during that hearing you had a, I think it was a city council member who was uh, distraught over what had happened uh, not that far from here. You had uh, a claim that business people were concerned that elderly people were afraid to go to restaurants and stores in the area, um, that youth you know, could be harmed by what was going on. Uh, and all those things made it into the record here. The judge here made the decision that the judge here made. The case went on, of course, to uh, the Court of Appeals. The DA, and this is the perspective, I guess, that I bring, uh, other than my co-chair uh, position. I was a prosecutor for 22 years. Uh, I didn't start in 1980 or 81. I was just finishing college at that time. But in 1987, I started in the DA's office in Monroe County. Uh, and the DA here, we called him Arcara. I don't know the correct pronunciation, but in Rochester, we called him Richard Arcara. Uh, he took the position that um, it could lead to violent reactions if this was allowed to continue, that there'd be potential harm to minors, that it would be a deterrent to minors who themselves might be soliciting, I guess without their parents' permission because they were minors. Um, and it was a public nuisance. That was the, the, the biggest concern uh, voiced by uh, him. And you heard today uh, Mr. Gardner's voice at the Supreme Court. And I, I, I don't know you, Mr. Gardner. I don't know if you were to the Supreme Court before this or not. But I'll tell you this, you were not intimidated. You know, we, we heard it in your voice. And um, I reviewed that transcript as in getting ready for today. And this is my favorite part. It was not a part that you heard. Uh, the justice says to you, um, you mean he can just take his chances, solicit anybody he wants to, as long as he doesn't know? He isn't annoying anybody just by soliciting anybody on the street? And with, clearly without batting any eyelashes or, or any hesitation, you say, Your Honor, that is not what I say at all, and that is not the facts of this case. And then the court says, well, I, and you interrupt, and you say, what the people are saying is that there is a per se absolute prohibition which is constitutionally permissible that no man or woman can ever have this kind of a conversation with any other person anywhere in the state of New York under any circumstances. That's my favorite line out of the, out of the whole argument. And uh, certainly um, there were other issues in the case, but you uh, were a trailblazer. You were someone who, as a DA practicing in Monroe County some years later, 1987, there were cases where the police were acting in an undercover capacity and going into Highland Park uh, because there had been reports of young men uh, being seen in the public areas of the park and then meeting up and going behind bushes and in amongst the rhododendrons and uh, the other flowers that that park is, the lilac bushes that that park is uh, fairly renowned for in the Rochester area. And uh, charges were made under the harassment statute, which is alluded to during the Supreme Court argument. And uh, the DA's position in that case at that time, and remembering that DAs are elected officials, 
they have to respond to uh, public concern and they have to be voted in every four years. Uh, the DA, when talking to those of us who were handling those cases and prosecuting them, cited your case and said, our position is we are going to dismiss these cases. And it all came back to because of you. So uh, you made more of an, a, an influence than you realize, I think. And with that, I would ask you to please come forward and accept this award that you are very deserving of. Thank you very much for this. I've always been an emotional person, and uh, it is difficult at my present age to be here and not fall apart. I grew up in a, in a period where Sexual deviancy was uh, not acceptable and um, pretty much scorned. And yet, I encountered people who had desires and, and had difficulty containing them. The police, early on, set traps. They would go out and actually solicit sexual involvement under the pretense that they were not officers of law, but that they were interested in this. And it took it took not much of an enticement for the individual in public to succumb to the solicitation. The result was being booked through the county, the police officer's thing and facing a situation where one's name would be in the newspaper very soon, and the individual be, would be mortified. I want to, uh, it, it just struck me as being fundamentally unfair. And I had set out the, in the beginning of this procedure to put it, put it right. This did not evoke much honor or pleasure from my daughter who went to Nichols School and who read in the newspaper about her father representing deviates. Um, but it had to be done. I was not fearless. I was with a large law firm, which had limits necessarily as to what they would uh, tolerate. When I went with Hodgson Russ, the beginning, I, I made a point of the fact that I was uh, concerned with civil rights. I was active with the, with the American Civil Liberties Union, things of that sort. And uh, the response I got, rather than being 
you don't want that. We, we're not looking for that type of person. Was the response to just take care of your cases and this other thing that you do is it needs to be done, use good judgment. Well, I've, and this involved me in various civil liberties type th things, which I did as an, an aside. It necessarily got my name in the newspaper. I would uh, go to work the next morning and be a little concerned as to whether that was the kind of publicity that Hodgson Rusk was one, eager to have. They never, they never said anything about uh, to to alarm me. Just keep on getting your work done, and 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 that'll be the way it goes. I. Among the other, th among other things, this ultimately led to a, a crisis, at least in my mind. The police were, were making arrests on this largely of, for, the, for the publicity it evoked, which they considered to be good for the cops. And the gay community or the civil liberties community was resisting every way they could, but they couldn't find many lawyers who would get to work on this type of thing. And um, I allowed is how I would help. I was with a firm which was a very progressive firm and I followed the rule that uh, if they don't say no, that's okay. Say they said yes. <laughs> and as a result, my name would appear in the newspaper a number of times. I kept waiting for the, uh, uh, my hands to be slapped and uh, so that's not the kind of solicitation and extracurricular publicity we're seeking. They never, never said no. Anyway, came to this event. The police had free reign. Uh, one officer, I've always been confused as to whether he was with the police department or the sheriff's department seemed to they seemed to work together and he um, would follow the practice of trying to entrap people who he thought were out looking for some love in the wrong places and um, It bothered him a lot that a member of a prestigious law firm would have the audacity to come to the defense of the people who were least able to defend themselves. I wanted to be in a position where I could be most effective. As the um, working with the um, gay rights opportunists or gay rights uh, activities, I told them that they should assume that I would take these cases for free as long as I was able 
as long as I wasn't slapped down by the firm. The firm had been very generous in allowing me to do public interest laws, uh, lawsuits. And this struck me, this injustice, the way that it was being done, struck me as being particularly uh, needful of, a, of it being addressed. On the events at the moment, the, there was an active effort by the police or, the, or by certain members of the police to entrap people in to uh, reacting positively to an invitation for sex. And it couldn't be a worse, um, a, uh, it couldn't be worse justice. They, they could not make a, a bigger mistake than to, they being gay people, than to react positively to an invitation for sex in the cemeteries, in the parks, in any place where the uh, activity was occurring. I was incensed by the situation and the helplessness of the people, folks in responding to this. I let it be known that if anyone was arrested for gay sex, they could come to me and I would offer free representation. They would have the opportunity to make the final decision as to how to handle their case, if that be going before the court and pleading guilty and leaving town, I would support it. But I was hoping against hope that the time would come when this, the defendant would stand up and say no more. That time came, and Bobby Uplinger was the person. Result in the Supreme Court of the case was no action. Bobby Uplinger and I were together, sitting in the, in the row immediately in front of the judges, and the, somewhere along the line, the, it became obvious they, they were troubled by something. And the reason they were troubled was there was no rule is that if you take an appeal to the Supreme Court and, and uh, to about the decision of a particular case, that you have standing. You personally were affected by that case. I wasn't aware, of, well, I guess I was aware, but I wasn't thinking of it. Bob Uplinger had no standing of the Supreme Court because whether the Supreme Court uh, ruled one way or the other would not change the result for the individual. The Court of Appeals in New York had upheld Bob's position and um, we simply had no standing to go ahead. Well, I'm finding it difficult to speak as you, uh, as, as you can tell. I took the position that the, the word should go out 
wide and strong that if you were arrested, Bill Gardner would provide free legal services. One might question whether that is a place, the type of public, public uh, advertising that uh, the law would allow. But uh, there weren't many lawyers who were advertising that they would take a case and handle it for free, and you make the decision what, to, what you wanted to do or not do. My motive was selfish. I wanted there to come down a decision that the, the, the solicitation for sex with no money involved was perfectly all right. And there was a buzzing among the justices as to what was wrong, what, what, what happened. I learned later that the, the judge, I'm, I'm missing his name, but that, that's, um, the judge was looking at the record handed to him bench and could find no basis for standing. I, the fact is that in the Court of Appeals, we won. Somebody else was taking an appeal from the, from the uh, Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court. But they had no standing to, to do so. They weren't parties in the lawsuit. They weren't affected. They didn't go to jail. They didn't face the prospect of loss of any money. So the result was that, that the, uh, the case was dismissed. Search for robbery had been inadvertently granted. It would come to a decision by another case that the acts of the individuals who were appealing were personally affected. But we had, we had established what I wanted to establish the beginning, from the beginning that gays who were arrested by the police officers, in this case police, Buffalo police, had, no, had absolute freedom unless the complaint came from an individual personally offended, personally affected by the uh, action of the uh, gays. If, if somebody stole your money, then that gives you standing. If somebody says he would like to make love to you and you say yes, you've got no complaint. So I set it out to free the community from what this had become. And I appreciate your acceptance. I am a 90-year-old man. My speech is hesitant. I apologize for the, for the, well.
Well, I think that that is going to conclude our program. Again, we are so very honored, Mr. Gardner, that you have joined us and accepted our award and represent our area so well. And for everyone here, as you are leaving, there is lunch in the hallway. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Well, you know, okay, I, I just couldn't that. see. <laughs>